Hello and welcome to the October 2017, sorry, November 2017 installment of the Deep Carbon Observatory's webinar Wednesdays. This series of webinars is brought to you jointly by Synthesis Group 2019 and the DCR engagement team. My name is Katie Pratt and I'm part of the engagement team. My colleagues and I collaborate with Synthesis Group 2019 to bring DCO's scientific results together and help share these findings and discoveries with the scientific community, the media and the public. It's my pleasure today to introduce you to Louise Kellogg. Louise is the Director of the Computational Infrastructure for Geodynamics at the University of California, Davis. Her group studies the dynamics of the solid Earth, focusing on two areas, understanding how convection in the Earth's mantle operates and drives geologic processes, and understanding the forces causing earthquakes and landscape change. She uses computer modeling to understand the thermal and chemical evolution of Earth, as well as creating scientific visualizations for exploring Earth's surface and interior. Today, Louise will present a blueprint and virtual construction manual for integrating different types of data into a box model. Before we start, a few housekeeping bits. If you have a question, please post it in the chat room. Louise will answer them at the end of the webinar. We also invite you to turn on your webcam at this time if you would like to be a visible part of this virtual seminar. However, please keep your microphone muted to avoid feedback issues during the webinar. Now with that, I'll turn it over to Louise. Um, so I'm going to talk today about a blueprint for creating a box model uh, for the carbon cycle in the deep earth. And uh, I want to, again, thank the uh, names of the folks who are listed on this slide. It's a mix of students and senior colleagues and uh, collaborators who have helped uh, with, with this project in a variety of ways. So um, if we look at the, uh, if, we, if we start looking at um, how the carbon cycle on the earth is generally considered and look uh, anywhere, really in a textbook or in a, on Wikipedia or an image search on the web, we're gonna find an image of the carbon cycle that looks something like this. And it generally considers the atmosphere, the oceans, the exchange among these things uh, the soils, plants, animals, and fossil fuels, but rarely do these sorts of uh, models of the carbon cycle consider the deep earth, and rarely do they consider uh, earth through deep time. And so we'd like to remedy that by considering the carbon cycle on a planetary scale, considering the entire planet, and considering deep time. Uh, so we're going to focus today on, on what goes into developing a box model, what a box model is, what a model is, and uh, then um, with the intent of uh, leaving you with some examples of box models and how they can be used, but also leaving you with some ideas about how you can develop box models of your own if you want to try it. So uh, there's a challenge to trying to model the carbon cycle through deep time and through the entire scale of the Earth. And that is that the processes that we consider are really wide ranging in their, uh, in their magnitude of space and time. So the time scales on this is just a, a chart of kind of some of the processes that are in operation here uh, in geophysics and geodynamics and in uh, geochemical cycles in the Earth. For example, the sort of magma cycle is um, you know ranges over several orders of magnitude time. The mantle conduction cycle is operating on billions of years. Uh, whereas the cycle of individual grains or at the atomic or molecular cycle is operating on a much, much smaller space and time scale. And any model that is considering the planet as a whole needs to be aware of these differences in space and time and take them into consideration. What that means is that we will have to simplify as we go from one time and space scale to another. So let's start, talk for a minute about modeling uh, and why we do modeling at all. And so what is the role of modeling in science? And, and let's start out by thinking about that. So first, a model is really there to describe a system. It's often there to answer a scientific question or to guide observational or experimental directions. What I mean by that is that a model can generate a hypothesis that can then lead to testable observations. Uh, and finally, a model can make predictions, and those can be predictions about the future, but they can also be predictions about what observations we can make in a natural system like the Earth. The main thing to keep in mind is that modeling often means different things to different scientists, depending on what their needs are or what questions they're working on. I'm going to dive into that a little bit before we get into box models. 
uh, a cons and, and sort of sorts of models, just describe a few categories of models that we might be thinking about. Uh, one is a conceptual model, and I think of a conceptual model as an idea that's expressed in words or maybe in pictures like this one, or uh, in, in another way, in a concept, maybe by a, a metaphor, uh, that describes the idea of how the system works, in this case, the Earth. And here we have a cross-section, a cartoon picture of a cross-section of the Earth that's intended to represent the Earth as it is now. It's representing subduction zones as blue, continental crust as green, and the mantle as a mix of orange and yellow uh, with multiple components or reservoirs, and then the core as that brighter orange in the center. And this is intended to basically describe an idea of how we would consider the, uh, what we would think of as the interior of the Earth. This is going to drive the, the uh, conceptual models that we have about how the work, Earth works. It's going to drive some of the more quantitative modeling that we do. A mathematical or statistical model is a way of describing the system using a set of equations or, or uh, by a statistical characterization of the, of the model. And so that in our... In, in the work that we're doing, uh, what we're interested primarily in is mathematical models that involve deciding on uh, determining what the governing equations for a system is, determining its initial conditions and its boundary conditions in order to be able to solve those equations or approximate solutions to those equations to describe the behavior of our system. And that will generate uh, behaviors that, uh, that we can then gain insight from. Physical models may be quite... Um, Familiar to many of you, a physical model is basically a scaled model of a system. Here's an example of a diamond anvil press in which the properties of the material are being studied at extreme conditions uh, and with the intent of revealing insight into how the material would behave in the interior of the planet. And uh, finally, we have uh, computational models. And in a, typically in a computational model, we are taking a conceptual model, turning it into a mathematical model, that's informed by what we understand of a physical system, and then solving or approximating the solution to those mathematical equations using numerical approximations. The model I'm showing here right now was designed to uh, be a very simple model to illustrate a process of mixing in the mantle, and that's going to be relevant to our box model. So this is a two-dimensional model. It's a flat earth. It's the mantle. It's heated from within, and it's cooled from above. So the heat is being generated by radioactive a decay of radioactive elements, and it's being cooled by above, from above by plate tectonics. I've introduced a, uh, a dot, a white dot, that is a, a bunch of small passive tracers. And you can see that through time, uh, through uh, downwellings and upwellings in this model, the, those markers are being dispersed throughout. And we can do some analysis of this as to where they go, how rapidly they are mixed, uh, and the sort of scales of those small tendrils that are now developing on the screen. And this is going to help us when we get into box modeling as well. This is a fully dynamical model, but it is obviously greatly simplified from the way the Earth itself behaves. And so this tells you something about the pitfalls and the strengths of all these models. In the case of a computational model, we can specify the boundary conditions and the initial conditions and specify the governing equations, but we don't know all of the physics of, and chemistry of the system, so we're almost certainly going to have to simplify the planet in order to model it in this way. Okay, so what's a box model then? A box model basically treats the Earth like it's a chemical factory. It's got a series of tanks, which we call reservoirs. It has a series of pipes between those tanks, and it has a series of valves on the pipes that control how much material can flow through the pipes, and we call those fluxes. So the nice thing about a uh, box model is that uh, by treating the Earth as a set of boxes or, or tanks and, um, and valves, uh, basically reservoirs and fluxes, we can come up with a fairly simple mathematical representation. That mathematical representation is a set of ordinary differential equations that we can often solve. Sometimes we can solve them analytically or we can solve them computationally. Uh, so there's some simplifications that go into this. One is that we tend to assume, have to assume that those reservoirs are well mixed, that they are homogeneous, and then we will have to make assumptions about what controls the fluxes between the reservoirs. So let's uh, dig into this a little bit more. Um, I want to emphasize that the idea of box modeling has been around for quite a while. 
And in the context of the mantle, it goes back to the 1970s. So there were box models proposed by uh, Jacob Jacobson and Wasserberg and by Paolo and uh, by Leg and others. And I'm showing you here an example of one of those. So this is an example in which Oleg consolidated the concept of these reservoirs and fluxes into a single concept called which he called chemical geodynamics. And we're going to draw on that chemical geodynamics. He treated the earth, the mantle, as uh, two reservoirs, an upper and a lower, uh, and then considered what happened when you had two boxes uh, and uh, or one box and how the exchange between those reservoirs and between those two reservoirs and a single reservoir he called the continental crust, how that would happen. And so this leads to a simplified set of equations. It's interesting to me to note that this concept predates a real knowledge, a full knowledge of the Earth's structure, such as we can have now. So for anyone who has studied seismology at all, you'll be, you may be aware that uh, Javonsky and Anderson published a model, a seismic model of uh, the Earth called PREM, the Preliminary Reference Earth Model. All tomographic models uh, draw on these reference models as their basis. They published that in 1981, and that was really uh, the time when we started to fully understand uh, some, some of the structures in the mantle. So chemical geodyna geodynamics and the box modeling approach kind of predates that a little bit. They didn't have the benefit of seismic imaging at the time when they were de developing these. Okay, so this classical approach of chemical geodynamics primarily deals with trace elements, trace components. And what I mean by trace components is these are components that are the flavor of the mantle. If we think of the mantle as being a cake <laughs> that we are baking, uh, they are the vanilla and the almond extract that flavor the cake. They don't change the behavior of the mantle. Rather, they primarily uh, track what has happened to the mantle through time. And the ones that are most useful to us come with a built-in clock uh, due to radioactive decay. So you saw my uh, model of mixing, the simplified model of mixing. It led to these sort of tendrils. And uh, that's also illustrated in this marble cake, this photograph of a marble cake. Uh, in which uh, basically there's been mixing between two reservoirs, two components, the chocolate and the vanilla batter. Uh, they are incompletely mixed. And so chemical geodynamics or a box model would be able to tell us about that process. So uh, what does that lead to? Well, some of the flavors in the mantle are very ancient. We know that from the clocks that come with them. Uh, and so we can we basically have known for quite some time that we can define a series of components of the mantle using this, pro this method uh, of box modeling and um, basically sorting the uh, components into different, into different categories. And that's illustrated with these figures uh, from publications of a variety of people, uh, and which we, we see on the left, uh, the helium, three helium four ratios, a compilation of them from oceanic basalts. The mid-ocean ridge basalt source is quite uniform, and the ocean island basalt uh, source is quite uh, heterogeneous uh, and contains components that are uh, thought to be very ancient. Similarly, when we start to look at other systems, we can sort the Earth into various components, uh, EM1, EM2, FOSO, HIMU, DMM. These all uh, have uh, speak to their origin, and they are basically uh, learn, they're they're uh, determined by looking at the tracers, these tracers through um, at a variety of ocean island basalts and at mid-ocean ridges. So this is a, a study of the mantle through mantle-derived rocks, and it gives us this overarching kind of picture of of the major components of the mantle using these tracers that don't influence the dynamics very much. So uh, from that, from knowing that there are ancient reservoirs uh, due to this, this uh, chemical geodynamics approach, we can start to think about a, 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 about a conceptual model for the Earth. And a conceptual model might look like the one I've showed, I'm showing you right here, uh, basically looking at a kind of conceptual uh, idea of the cross-section of the Earth through time, through the, through the past uh, 250 million years. Uh, along the top is a chart of basically what's going on at the surface, essentially tectonic activity at the surface. And uh, what's drawn at the bottom in the cross section is the persistence of reservoirs through that time uh, in a deep mantle reservoir. 
Okay, so that's what chemical geodynamics really has been primarily used for over time. But what about the components that influence the dynamical behavior? Uh, and so um, let's look at those for a minute. So going back to our cake analogy, our marble cake, uh, these would include, previously we were talking about the vanilla and the almond extract, and now we're talking about things like the egg, which is the binder, and the gluten flour, which controls the rheology of the batter and water, which also controls the rheology of the batter, and then the rising agents, right? And so in the mantle, we're talking about the major components, and we're talking about components like water and like carbon that can that have are active, uh, and have uh, and and so therefore have to be treated a little bit differently. And this com complicates our our box modeling uh, effort. So the Deep Carbon Observatory, of course, has been very engaged in this, and I just want to highlight two relatively recent uh, efforts to uh, publications that, um, that attempt to look at the current flux rate between different components in the mantle. Uh, I won't go into these. You can see the references here and, uh, and look them up for yourself, but they, are, uh, they inform what we do for the rest of, of this talk uh, in terms of how we define our reservoirs and fluxes, and they are primarily focusing on the fluxes of carbon into the mantle and out of the mantle via volcanism and subduction. And so those are the primary focus of, of uh, what you're seeing of these two figures on the, on the screen. <clears throat> so if we're going to design a box model for the Earth, the first thing we have to decide is what are our reservoirs and what are our transport pathways. And so uh, here are some of the major reservoirs of the, of the Earth. Um, so unlike that first figure I showed you where, I where you know, it had all of uh, the oceans, the atmospheres, and, and uh, everything that's happening on the surface, here we've basically consolidated most of those reservoirs into just a very few. So we're treating the entire atmosphere as one reservoir. We're te treating the oceans as one atmosphere, as one reservoir, sorry. We're treating the continental crust as one reservoir. The organics can include everything from uh, soils, fossil fuels, um, plants, etc., all in one reservoir. So we're really consolidating these into a few. And um, by basically uh, doing a sort of study of the literature, we've come up, we've, we've, um, uh, we've summarized what is known about the quantity of carbon, the likely quantity of carbon in these reservoirs, in these main, six main reservoirs. Uh, I've used, I've settled on using the units of gigatons. So this is gigatons of carbon. A gigaton is 10 to the 12 tons. And you'll notice this very wide range of differences between the, the different reservoirs. So the core has uh, four times 10 to the ninth gigatons of carbon. It's by far in this the biggest uh, volume of carbon in the planet. The earth is, or sorry, the mantle is about an order of magnitude lower than that. And the continental crust has about an order of magnitude less carbon than the mantle. And that in the continental crust, that's primarily in the form of carbonates. The oceans are lower yet. They have uh, 10 to the fourth gigatons, 4 times 10 to the fourth gigatons. And the atmospheres are even smaller. The atmosphere is even smaller. It currently has about 850 or 860 gigatons of carbon in it currently. A number in parentheses is an assumption that we're going to use later about what might have been in the atmosphere in the early Earth. So just to emphasize this point about the relative size of the reservoirs, I've taken those boxes, these six boxes, and redrawn them to scale uh, based on the magnitude of, of the quantity of carbon in them. So that large red box is the core is the carbon in the core. The mantle is the orange box next to it, and the continental crust is the the brown box next to it. And then there's one pixel in the top left-hand corner that's blue. And if we magnify that a thousand times, we get the box in the upper left, which contains the oceans, the organic component, and the current atmosphere. What this means is that the small reservoirs do not meaningfully change the large reservoirs in any model that we get. Rather, the large reservoirs really act as a, as a um, an element of change for the smaller reservoirs. And that, uh, that will come into play in the box models. It means that we can, in, in effect, leave out some of the reservoirs as being um, not so much reservoirs, but uh, pathways full of carbon. So let's just briefly discuss the core. 
the carbon mass in the core of uh, 10 to the 9th gigatons is based on primordial abundances. Uh, it's believed that the carbon was partitioned into the core during core formation, so very early in the, uh, in the Earth, in the Earth's history. And we are going to assume that there's no significant flux of carbon between the core and the mantle since core formation around 4.5 billion years ago. And what that means is that for the rest of this talk, I'm going to neglect the core. And so uh, there's a wide uncertainty of the, of, in the mass of, in, the, in our understanding of the mass of carbon in the core, but it will not matter for the box models going forward because we're going to assume that um, we don't, uh, it, that it doesn't interact with the other reservoirs going forward. So now if we set aside the core, what we have left is uh, the mantle, the continental crust, and the atmosphere. And this is uh, basically a sketch of the box model that we're gonna, gonna be using from here on out. So the reservoirs, the, the, the tanks in our chemical factory are the circle, circular structures. And the boxes are basically processes by which the uh, carbon moves between these. And the arrows represent the fluxes. So you can think of the arrows as being the pipes and maybe the boxes as being the valves between those pipes that determine the rates and then the circles as being the, uh, the reservoir. <clears throat> if we're just considering the current time, we could uh, remove the atmosphere from this because it has so little carbon compared to the crust and the mantle. But for the purposes of this talk, we want to go back into deep time. And so we're going to look at the, at the atmosphere as well. We're going to include the atmosphere for as, as well. So in each of these, the letter J represents a carbon flux. Uh, the subscript represents where it's going, where it's coming where it's coming from and where it's going. So the JMA is, the, uh, is a flux of carbon from the mantle to the atmosphere. And then the JMM is a flux of carbon through a mid-ocean ridge, but back into the mantle at subduction zone. So that's carbon that's coming out and then going back into the mantle and, uh, and so on. So each of those, so the three subscripts are A for atmosphere, M for mantle, and C for continental crust. And you'll notice that I have not included the core, and I've also not included any deep mantle reservoir, which may be isolated from the rest of the mantle. So this is to simplify our box model down to three primary boxes uh, with fluxes between them. It's already complicated enough. So with, to um, reiterate that, we are assuming basically that the mantle is well mixed uh, with a nearly uniform um, concentration of carbon, that's the reservoir that is interacting with the surface. And uh, this is um, justified by, the, by measurements of carbon fluxes at mid-ocean ridges, which are pretty quite uniform, and that indicates that the upper mantle has a, a nearly constant concentration of carbon. Uh, and then we take uh, this uh, carbon concentration and, uh, and infer the mass of carbon in the mantle within the mantle the mental reservoir of interest, which is four times 10 to the eighth gigatons. That's where that number came from. Came from, And you'll see that the you know, uncertainties on that are probably at least uh, 10 to the eighth gigatons. <clears throat> okay, so next let's consider the continental crust in this. And when we consider the continental crust, the mass of carbon there uh, is primarily in, in the form of carbonates. And so the mass of carbon and carbonate rocks is uh, is in the range of 10 to the seventh gigatons. Where did this come from? This originated when silicate sediments were converted to carbonates through the Urey reaction. That was proposed by Urey in a book about the Earth and planets uh, in 1952. And it's summarized again by Kramer's in 2002. Uh, and the reaction is shown there. So whatever controls the rate of the Urey reaction is going to be important for understanding the rates of our um, of our uh, carbon cycle in deep time. And that may be the exposure of sediments and it may be the uh, acidity of, of uh, available water as well. So uh, our atmospheric carbon uh, is from measured uh, paleo atmospheric carbon masses, uh, decreases through time. Three and a half billion years ago, it was on the order of 10 to the six gigatons and then it drops to 10 to the fourth. And finally, to today, this is a measurement from August of uh, 862 gigatons. You'll notice in this, uh, in this uh, the oceans are not a reservoir primarily. They are primarily a pathway. 
And uh, they, that's because the time scales, back to that time scale thought, the time scales for, uh, for carbon to move through the oceans is, so, is fast enough that we don't need to consider it as a reservoir in the, for the purposes of this model, for the time scales that we're looking at. If we were looking at a purely uh, recent model or a model of paleoclimate, we would need to include it as a reservoir because that would be an important reservoir component. So the scales of your reservoirs um, determine, and the time scales involved determine which reservoirs you include in a box model and which ones you include as, as pipes. Okay, so then what do we do next? Well, we take each of those arrows and we now turn them into, uh, define what those fluxes are. And uh, this is a very busy slide, but I just want to show you this as an example of what we're talking about. So the very first one is the flux from the mantle to the atmosphere. And it is uh, determined by the mass of carbon in the mantle now uh, and the mass of carbon in the mantle um, at the beginning of the model, which would be, uh, we start our models at the, at the onset of formation of the continental crust. And then there's this uh, decay constant uh, through time. And what that is, is a representation of the rate of, uh, of um, the presumed rate of, of action, of activity of plate tectonics through time. And it's based on a classical parameterized convection model. So there we're introducing some physics um, of how fast spreading rates happened through time due to decay of, uh, of heat production in the Earth. And that is all embedded in that uh, time, time constant in the exponent of that, of that first flux that's defined. The next one, the atmosphere to the Uri re reaction to the continental crust has uh, two, component, two portions, depending on when we're talking about through time. And the first one has, is uh, basically the mass of carbon in the atmosphere. And then that, that time constant for that is, uh, is based on what, the, what controls the urea reaction. Again, how much continental crust, how much um, sediment is available for, for alteration, and what is the rate of alteration. So a lot of physics and chemistry is embedded in a single time scale for each of these fluxes. And that is where an exploration of a box model can really allow you to understand which are the controlling parameters, which, which pro processes and factors control uh, the behavior of the system, even though we may not have a complete understanding of those rates. We can experiment with the rates and say, what if we speed this up? What if we slow this down in order to understand how the system behaves as a system? So that's the power of this kind of model by simplifying a very complex set of processes down to a single time scale or a single flux, uh, we get a lot of ability to experiment. So what do we do with those fluxes? So we've defined fluxes for all, all of the arrows have a defined flux and all of them have time scales. Some of them appear uh, in multiple places as well. So what do we do with those? Well, now we can basically look at the, um, at what is happening in each of our reservoirs. And so our reservoirs, our reservoir equations are basically a mass balance for each of those. So the change, the first equation is just what's going on in the atmosphere. That's the change of the mass of carbon in the atmosphere through time. And it is essentially equal to the flux is in of carbon in minus the fluxes out of that reservoir. And so that will include things like the drawdown of atmospheric carbon due to formation of carbonates and then the subduction of those carbonates. And it will include outgassing of the mantle due to volcanic activity and it will include you know, both at mid-ocean ridges and at um, subduction zones. So it's going to include all those components in there, all embedded into that equation. And then we have similar equations for the flux of the, for the, um, uh, balance of carbon in the uh, in the continental crust and in the mantle reservoir, and these also require us to understand the fluxes at mid-ocean ridges and at ocean trenches as well. So those are the other two components to this, and those are our set of uh, of differential equations. And so everything now depends on the assumptions that we make and how we solve those equations. So let's spend the rest of our time exploring two ideas, two two models, two hypotheses for this. Um, the first one is uh, an idea suggested by, uh, previously by uh, 
Stanley and Sleep, uh, that uh, if we look at the planet Venus and see that it's got a lot of CO2 in it, that is suggestive that perhaps the Earth in its early years had a lot of atmospheric carbon. So uh, if we scale up the amount of CO2 that, the, uh, that Venus's atmosphere has to the slightly bigger size of planet Earth, we will find that it is sufficient carbon to be the origin of, of crustal carbon through the Earth reaction. So we could um, envision our first sort of assumption is that the Earth started out with a lot of carbon in its atmosphere and that that has been turned into crustal carbon through time. Uh, our second model that we're going to play with is to uh, look at the present flux of CO2 from the mantle through mid ocean ridges and uh, and we, can, we will see that that is sufficient to provide the crustal carbon over geologic time. And we're going to do that just by uh, looking at two of these models. So here's the first assumption. So this is the assumption in which the atmospheric carbon started out very high. This is the reason the atmosphere is still a model, is still a reservoir in this model, uh, and that it has been drawn down over time to form crustal carbonates. And so we took those equations that I showed you, those flux equations, and um, program them up in the, in the Jupyter Notebook system. Uh, this was done by my graduate student. And um, so we were, um, so we are basically looking at the output of, of those sorts of models. And so what you see here is the three primary reservoirs through time, uh, with present being on the right uh, and the original uh, beginning of the Earth on the left. Uh, at about half a billion years into Earth history, we assume that the continental crust has started to form and the atmospheric carbon is being drawn down uh, as the continental crust carbon increases. And you'll notice that the uh, mantle carbon is balanced in this. So the, the amount of carbon coming out of the mantle through volcan volcanism is being balanced by the amount of carbon being subjected uh, into the mantle. So. So that's, uh, that's one consequence of this. Now let's actually look at what's going on in the, uh, in the last um, couple of billion years. Uh, so it looks on this figure that, this, that the atmospheric carbon has basically stopped changing, but it has not completely ch stopped changing. So essentially the original uh, formation of carbonates uh, has um, uh, took most of the carbon, but it continues to drop time due to continued uh, Uri reaction activity through time. Uh, it just, this is now a expanded version of that last um, couple of billion years and uh, that shows the, the gradual drawdown as the atmosphere, uh, as the atmosphere carbon decreases through time. So the second model is a little bit different in that it has an imbalance between the ocean ridge and subduction fluxes, which means that the mantle carbon is going to change through time. And so the green line is the mantle carbon and the um, blue is the atmosphere, the orange is the continental crust again. You can see that as the continental crust starts to grow, uh, it is pulling atmospheric carbon, uh, it, sorry, it is pulling carbon out of the mantle due to this uh, process of, um, of volcanism and then, uh, and then again the urea reaction forming carbonates. And the atmosphere here looks like it, as though it is not changing through time. But again, if we expand the scale, we see that it is also uh, exchanging carbon with the continental crust and with the mantle through subduction. And so it is gradually losing carbon, but it's at a much, much smaller scale, much, much smaller scale participation in this. So, so basically, uh, we can pull this um, all together by looking at, uh, at, you know, doing some comparison of the flux of carbon out of the mantle, and I think it's interesting to look at the flux of carbon out of the mantle by comparison to the current anthropogenic carbon flux. Um, the flux of carbon out of the mantle right now at mid-ocean ridges is approximately 36 megatons per year, and the anthropogenic carbon flux is uh, 4 gigatons per year. So that's quite a big difference, and um, it tells you that this sort of long-term model is really operating on a very different space and time scale and magnitude scale than, uh, than what's happening right now in the Earth. Um, but using that uh, carbon flux out of, out of the mantle, we can compute a uh, replacement time for the mantle carbon as we recycle, uh, as we have uh, volcanic outgassing and then recycling through 
subduction zones, and that replacement time is approximately 5 billion years. So essentially the carbon flux uh, out of, into the mantle and out of the mantle currently is approximately uh, constant, and uh, that can be embodied in that quote. What goes down mostly comes up uh, from the Kellerman and Manny paper that I showed you earlier. Okay, so we're going to wrap up here. Uh, we are using box modeling to consider two limiting cases for the growth of carbon in the continental crust. One limiting case is that the continental crust carbon comes sphere, and another limiting case is that it comes from the mantle. Both of these, either of these is acceptable in terms of the models and the observational constraints uh, that we now have, but a combination of both of them will also be acceptable, and this can be tested by further box modeling and by improving our observational knowledge about the history of carbon in the atmosphere. And I'll end it there, and I'd be happy to take any questions about any aspect of this. So okay. thank you, Louise. Um, I put my webcam back on so people can see me. Um, looks like Josh had a question. Would it be feasible to use a box model to depict space as a reservoir of sorts in terms of the possible space. delivery? Yeah, as a terms of the possible delivery of early Earth's carbon via planetary collision. That is a yes. It would yes. Of course, it would. I, I think one thing that we are assuming in the box models as we've designed them right now is that the Earth as a system is a closed system. And so those, those equations are balancing in and out of the different reservoirs. And so bringing it in from outside, from extraterrestrial sources, basically means opening up that constraint. It really just means adding a source term somewhere in the, uh, on the right-hand side of one of those equations. Uh, probably into the oceans or something, and, and then uh, pulling it out, uh, pulling it out from there. So that would be it. Would be a pulse, essentially a source, a point source, as a pulse uh, somewhere in there, and, and that would be fun to do. <laughs> um, looks like someone's still typing. Maybe we have any more questions. Doesn't look like it, but I'm sure if people okay. have more questions, they can get in touch with us at the engagement team or directly with you, Louise. Um, so, um, so thank you for this really great presentation, and thank you to everyone for tuning in to um, listen to the webinar. If you have any ideas for future webinar Wednesday series, please feel free to contact me and let me know. This was actually the last in this current series, um, and you can find an archive of this webinar. Um, shortly, along with all the other previous webinars in the series, on the DCO website. We'll be back in 2018 with a new series, so keep an eye on the DCO website and monthly newsletter for more information. Thanks again for joining us. Thank you for having me.